Peace, peace. Bargani, Islam, Salam, Ete Pu, and Robot. Gino Laco Ninani, Chief Nobo Bandele Elamin, back again for another video. In today's video, we will be discussing the Moors. So we'll be looking at the history of the Moors and we will be looking at its association with Africa and the different systems of Moors and its connection with Arabs. So, you know, today we hopefully will settle some of the confusion that has been, you know, propagated for the past, I don't know, several years. The historical community and the Moorish community and even, you know, dealing with the African centered or Afrocentric community. So, uh, so before we get into all of that, uh, we're going to look first, check out uh, the Holy Ancestral Covenant and uh, you can get your book here. Look, I even got mine. Hold on. Let me grab it. All right. Check out the uh, Holy Ancestral Covenant. Okay. Got your own. Get your copy today. Uh, you can get your copy on Amazon.com. Um, or you can give me a call and you can order it direct. All right. So. Uh, enough being said on that. So we also got, let me get this right. So let's, okay, so check it out. Let's look at, before we get into anything else also, you can also check out my books on Amazon as well. Uh, you know, we also are dealing with the more information you'll find in more. Moors, Moors, nationality, birthright, and Jewish prudence. And you also find a little bit of this in indigenous manual life. Uh, we also have the Moors Treaty, which is important for Moors to understand, overstand. So I got the Moors, and then I got other books. So just check me out. Uh, type me in and check out my books and see if you uh, care to get any. Uh, also, if you would like... Like we've done a video on the religious plates, but we have the Morris American these are plates, but these are religious plates. So if you uh, are interested in getting your religious plates, please go to indigenousservices.west.com and you can check them there. You can also give me a call at this number, okay? And if you would like to donate any funds to the cause, you can do so at Cash App, uh, dollar sign, and more. You see how it's done down there. Check it out. Please donate. Like I said, we need a temple. We need land. We need uh, several things that need to be implemented, and so any donation can help. It also helps with the channel to help bring uh, more quality videos as well. So please uh, donate it can. There's a lot. I don't even know how I'm going to get all this in, okay? Because there's a lot to be dealt with. Um, what I'm looking at is, you know, we, we want to look at what Moors are. And one of the ways that I want to look at Moors is to look at the land. Because usually when you talk about a group of people, they have a piece of land. So we want to look at Moors from that perspective. And we also want to look at them from an ethnic. And we also want to look at the relationship of Arabs to Moors. Okay, because definitely that is the connection that we're most familiar with. But there are a lot of surprises what I was looking at and seeing when I started looking at the uh, history of the land. So when you think about, 
like when you really think about Moors, the word Moors comes from the word Mari, okay? Uh, I want to look at the brief, like, like, like let's look at the definition of Moors first so we can get there, okay? And then we're going to expand a little bit. Yeah, you dig? So when we look at, when we look at the Moors, you know the computer want to move at its own speed. Like this is just a basic, but this basic information has been like like extrapolated in so many different forms and stuff that people are really confused with what the Moors is. They think a Moor is Arab. They think a Moor is just a Berber. They think a Moor is or that. But we're going to try to get in between and look at a little bit of what a Moor is, okay, and how this term became even to be, okay. So the term Moor right here is an exonym. Okay, now we're going to look at that word because we need to understand what that is. An exonym is an endonym, okay? It's him, and it's a common internal name for a geographical place, a group of people, or a language, okay? Meaning that it is used inside a place or that group or that linguistic community in question. It says it is their self-designating name for themselves, their homeland, and or their language. So the more the name more is a name that was given to themselves, okay, by that group of people. So I wanted it to be understood. Okay, so when we look at the term more, it is used first used by Christian Europeans to designate Muslims inhabitants of Maghrib, the Iberian or Iberian Peninsula, Sicily, Malta during the Middle Ages. Okay, now check. Europeans being these people who practice Islam that are in predominantly North Europe. Okay. So these Christians, Christian Europeans, okay, got Christian Europeans who are identifying these people as Moors, okay, that are in the southern region of Europe during the Middle Ages. So when we're talking about the Middle Ages, we're talking about in like 1100s, okay, because we're not talking about the Dark Age per se. But we're talking about 11, 12 hundreds, okay? So this is like way after Moors had been in the region that they're being considered these things at this time. Because by the time that these Christian Europeans are talking about the Moors, the Moors had already been there. So they're identifying with these people who are Muslim inhabitants. Now, when you say Muslim, didn't use the word uh, Arab. Let's look at it though. Muslim. Because we do know that Arabs were in the region as well. Okay, so it's like they weren't, but they said people who practice, Muslims are people who follow or practice Islam. Okay. Doesn't say anything necessarily about Arab in that definition. So they're saying that, okay, okay it's more as people who practice Islam. Now, it says the Moors initially were indigenous uh, a Maghrebin. Okay, so what is a Maghrebin Berbers? They were identified as Maghrebin Berbers. What is the Maghrib? It is also known as Northwest Africa, the Arab Maghrib, and historically the Barbary Coast. We've heard that. It is the western part of North Africa and the Arab world. The region includes Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia. Okay, the Maghrib also includes different parts of where. So, but we're going to concentrate because this is the region of the Mauritania. Now, look, Mauritania has the word Mar more in it. Morocco has the word Mar. So these two terms right here are very linked. More. So we're going to look into that. We're going to look into Mauritania uh, very shortly. 
it says more are not thinkers. Observe there is no real ethnological value. Okay, Europeans in the Middle Ages and early modern period variously applied the name to Arabs, North African Berbers, as well as Muslim Europeans. Okay, so over time it's been associated, and this is where the fusion comes from, because of the different group of people who have been associated with that term. That term is a loose term that was being used by to describe people that were not them. The people who come from a region, they practice Islam, but you might have been light skinned, they consider you a more. It's not necessarily where the term come from. Okay. Then he said, got, it might have been even some de derogatory sense. Okay. A derogatory sense. Okay. The term has been used so a derogatory sense to refer to Muslims in general, so it gets it gets into some different stuff, and you know it, it gets different type of words. So how it's been described, Moro people, Moro is the beginning of Morocco. Okay, so all people have been considered somewhat more, and I think it's because of when these Europeans go out into the world, they start describing people to favor. Moors, because Moors had already been there and established some type of uh, cultural relationship with people, but also when the, the Europeans sailed over to these areas and regions, they tend to associate them with other people that they are familiar with. Okay, so with that being said, we got this is the general term that's being used for more okay now one of the one of the countries that we talked about was Mauritania so let's look at the kingdom of Mauritania because this is important Mauritania is definitely one of the main countries associated and so we're going to look at Mauritania. We're going to take a closer look at Mauritania, the kingdom of Mauritania. And, and that's how they may play a part. It says the kingdom of Mauritania came into existence around 225 BC in the third century. Its inhabitants come from Berber ancestry. They saw modern day ethnic taxonomies, uh, and currently it belongs to the western part of present-day Algeria. Now look, Mauritania was a kingdom of Berber Mari people who became, look, this is important because as Moors, as uh, people in the Moor Science Temple, they often, they often uh, saw Moors being associated with Canaan. This is going to explain some of that. It says that they, uh, it was a kingdom of Berber Mari people who came, who would become renowned history. Listen, it was the Phoenicians who named the area as Maharin, which means Western land. This would later be known as Mauritania. So the Phoenicians named the land. It wasn't uh, necessarily Greek or Roman that named it that. The Mauritanian kingdom is generally considered to have developed more slowly than the kingdom of Numidia. Numidia is also another uh, kingdom that is associated with Moors. It says the mountain massive of the Atlas protected Mauritania from the the last okay uh, then later Carthage as well as the initial Romans Roman attempt at conquest the people of Maritan Maritania had cities as well as rural life in fertile regions along the uh, Atlantic coast however it was the mountainous regions that, that tribes kept a identity Roman times and even beyond. 
The Maori were referred to as early as an expedition to Sicily in 406 BC. Before the kingdom of Mauritania, before the kingdom of Mauritania came into existence, the area was occupied by a people. Okay? By looking at some architectures, historians have developed something about the uh, the the tish, uh tradition. This tradition is based on the remains of 400 or so settlements. Okay, dates back to dating back to 2000 BCE. The area was based on the cultivation of the melon. However, with the environment becoming increasingly arid, this later became abandoned. This addition, so. This is the early now. Talk about the formation of Martania during the Punic was was decided by the decision of King Messenita to ally with Rome. Upon his return to Africa among uh, after forming this alliance, it was King Baga of Mauritania that provided a bodyguard. Thus, the war was decided, and King Baga's decision to aid Rome was a vital moment in history. He was the first known king of Mauritania, so King Baga. Next was uh, Bacchus one. Okay. I'm not going to get into that, but I think it gets important. There, there's there's some things, there's some jewels in the tool. It talks about uh, Bacchus, King Bacchus II was ruling. Okay. Their title was recognized by King Julius Caesar. Okay. So this is around, uh, we're talking around, around the time of Julius Caesar and, and whatnot. So Rome influence at this time. Okay. So. This is right here. This is not, I want to get into this because now this is kind of, I think a side note, but a sidebar. But when we talk about King Atlas, when we talk about Atlas, the first thing that comes to mind is maps, Atlas maps. Okay. But there was a King Atlas. Now we know King Atlas. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to go back to this real quick, but, uh, I want to show you a picture at the uh, of King Atlas. Cuz it right you, you see it says King Atlas was the king in Mauritania before 500 BCE. So when we look at let's see when we look at this when we look at King Atlas people who know who King Atlas is Trying to wait till it pull up, it won't pull it up. This is a thing key into talk there. We go. So, but look at King Atlas. King Atlas is holding a world. So, Atlas, this is how we know Atlas, King Atlas, you know, or didn't really like. King Atlas, which always seemed to be a Greco Roman, you know how it goes, story go. But this right here showing us that King Atlas was uh, not Greco, but it was King of Mauritania, the King of Mauritania. Okay? So I, I thought that was kind of interesting that when we look at the Atlas, when we think about the world. Atlas and the man holding the world up. I always thought it was Greco, but actually he's and you know that just goes to show the more of influence on Greco. Society. 
Uh, so, you know, Martin had relations. The interior, it says that, like, the trade and achievements, the Mediterranean coast of Mauritania had harbor reviews commercially trade with Carthage from around the time 400 BC. So we're talking about Mauritania and Moors really having a, a sense of being prior to Islam. You know, we're talking about 400 BC, so we're talking about almost like, you know, at least a thousand, almost a thousand years before, before Islam was on the scene. We're talking about Mauritania. Okay, so the interior was controlled by Berber tribes who carried out large amounts of trade with Carthage. The Mark, the uh, Mark, kings was okay, a large scale urbanization of the region. Okay, and was inspired by the development of the Roman Empire. So, did, like, at some point, that's what happened. Like, like they've been part of the Roman Empire. And see, like, all this, we're talking about all these things right here historically happened before what we call Christian uh, Europe, who began to call them Moors, or began to call people Moors at least 1,500 years almost later. You understand? Like, this was for like 400 BC or so. And like I said, and we talk about like the, the Christian European the spoke of Moors was in 1100, you know, uh, 80 or BCE. So we, like I said, 400 BC to 1100 AD. Come on, man, that's like like 1300 years later. So like the genotype or or the, or the thought process of what a Moor was had changed totally. You know, it had went through Rome, like this after Roman fell. You know, the Romans had fallen by the time talking about the European uh, uh, You know, this is un this is so uh, the Mark Mark and was responsible for a lot of success of Rome in Africa. So in the Africa. It was in this story, even Empire knew was not to be traffic. So, I mean, like, the Mauritanian kingdom was powerful enough to abstain from being totally annexed and taken over by Rome. The Mauritanian, the Mauritanians are Maori people, and they, and the Maori is a term used for Moors. So, if we look at, look at bring this in a little bit, we talked about even Libya because we talked about Martin and talked Libya, okay? In in the beginning, when we talked about the Magdurian, the, the Magdurian or Magdurian people were Libya, uh, pretty much North Africa, right? So another North African country that we talked about before is Libya. At first, Libya was inhabited by Berbers. Okay, after one thousand, like this, after one thousand BC, a people, a people from Lebanon, called Phoenicians, settled in Triple, Triple Titania, which is Western Libya. So they founded Tripoli. So the Phoenicians founded Tripoli. Later, they settled in Cyrene, Nasi. It's Easter Libya. So you got the Greeks that go one for five, the, uh, Ber uh, the Berber, uh, the, or the uh, Phoenicians set up in another spot. It is later, both areas of Libya became part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, uh, Septimius Severus, which I talked about to him before, which he is what they call one of the African emperors, okay? He was a native to city in Libya. Okay, so there was even what we'll consider more or Moorish 
affiliation at, in the Roman Empire because, you know, race wasn't necessarily deemed in the same way as it is today. You know, people didn't necessarily look at uh, what you call dark skin people, so called black or Negro color. Well, there were no such thing. You were you were part of your tribe. You know, he was uh, Libya. He was part of Libya, which was African, and they would have called him either swarthy, Moorish, or you know, dark, dark plush. But he didn't look at him as because he was that color that he was a slave or you know inferior. That wasn't necessarily the standard at that time. And like we said, he became a Roman emperor for you see a short time and he was from libya okay so i i want i just want to see that connection now when we talk about arabs being uh moors we're we talking about what are we talking about you know you got arabs like 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 a lot of stories like to say oh well you know the the Moors were really Arabic because we do know that like Arabs did come into North Africa shortly after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. The spread of Islam into uh, Africa, so we do know that things happened so now. Like one of the things we wanted to look at is what is an Arab? Because we think Arabs are a real people. So let's look at this. You can look at this, see it's a new world encyclopedia. So it says that there are very definitions commonly determined in Arab status. One of the things that makes you an Arab could be possibly was, uh, could be Islamic tradition, the Quran the not find who is an Arab. That's interesting. He says, but there is a verse in the Quran stating that there is no difference between an Arab or a Ajam, meaning a non-Arab speaker. Only by their God-fearingness. The Prophet Muhammad also noted that an Arab is anyone who speaks Arabic. So this is a general term. To describe an Arab. This does not necessarily describe an Arab as a pale, complected being. Now it says ethnic identity, someone who consists him or herself to be an Arab, and the look, regardless of racial or ethnic origin. It says as is recognized as such by others. So that again does not give a scientific or a real definition of what an Arab looks like as far as complexion. Now it says race. Race is the term Arab does not refer to a particular race. So look, Arab does not refer to a particular race. Arabs include Caucasians and Africans with ancestral origins in Europe North Africa and the Middle East. The intermarriage of Arab semen and their agents as far back as the first century. It says has left few pure in quotation Arabs racially. It says dark skinned Arabs are Sunnis, Ethiopian, and Somalian. Arabs and it says and Arabs from southern Egypt are also considered Africans. So there's a lot of uh you know, like, oh, I'm not African Arab. <laughs> no, that's not what, that's not the case. It says that Caucasian Arabs are Arabs that are native to Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya, among others. Now, see, this is what is causes the confusion. So-called Caucasian Arabs are have taken over, they took over North Africa. But these are not Berbers. These are not Berbers. You don't see Berbers in it. It says linguistic is also another one. It says someone who first language is Arabic. 
So you can be like dark as me and speak Arabic and can be considered an Arab, not based off of any race or ethnic identity. So when they say Arabs, when they say the Moors were Arabs, what are they really saying? There is no racial complexion. It says genealog genealogical, someone who can trace their ancestry back to the original inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula or Syrian desert. Arab nationalism declares that Arabs are united in a shared history, culture, and language. Arab nationalists believe that Arab identity encompasses more than outward physical characteristics of race or religion. In a related ideology, pan-Arabanism calls for all Arab lands to be united in one state. So I mean, even among Arabs, there's no real distinct color. Basically, it's that those who share a common cultural language or history. So, with that being we got to look at like where the origin is. They say that basically from the Arabian Peninsula is where you'll find Arabs to come from, where you can also find the word uh, Arabian or Arab. In the, you can see Arab in the, in the word Arabian. So the Arabian Peninsula is where you find them. So let us look at, let's look, let's see. There was one other part to look at that may be the key to this because when you look at the, when you look at like Southern Arabia or like uh, the Yemen, okay, when you look at the Yemen, you'll find that uh, Yemen or Yamani people were like Queen Sheba, okay? So let's look at Yemen and Queen Sheba, because when we talk about when we talk about uh, dark skinned melanated people or African people, Queen Sheba always comes into play. Because even with the stories with Sheba and King Solomon, and these stories play into Ethiopia, where you've got King or you got Menelik who comes on the scene, and we've talked about. Uh, this before. Okay. In the Yemen and Ethiopia claim Queen Sheba. Okay. We're going to look at just a, a, a definition of Queen of Sheba. Okay. And why is this important? Because when we, like we said, when we talk about these Arabs and their genealogy, you want to look at um, where they come from. Queen of Sheba is a figure mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, okay? Original story she brings in caravans of gifts to Solomon. This account has undergone extensive, you know, Ethiopian elaboration and has come become a subject of one of the most widespread fertile cycles of legends in the Middle East. Modern day historians identify Sheba with the South Arabian kingdom of Saba in present day Yemen. The queen's existence is disputed among historians, which that's something to get into. But Queen Sheba is a biblical character that's an African queen. Okay. She came to prove him in hard questions. Okay. It says that. Sheba was quite well known in the in, in, in the classical world. Okay. Around the middle of the first century, there were Sabaeans. Now, Sabaeans, we've talked about the Sabaeans. The Sabaeans have a direct relation to 
uh, Islam. Okay, but it says that they were in the Horn of Africa, in the Horn of Africa, in the area that later become the realm of Ax Aksum. Now, Aksum is what? Aksum is Ethiopia. Okay, so Ethiopian influence on that region because Ethiopia is right there with, um, right there in, in Yemen. Like Ethiopia and you got the, you got that whole region right there of Saudi Arabia right there at the Horn of Africa. Okay, look at the Horn of Africa. Let's see if we can throw a picture of the Horn of Africa. So right here is the Horn of Africa, okay? And then right here is Saudi Arabia. And then right here at the bottom is Yemen or Yemen. So if you can, you see it almost touch, okay? You see it almost touch. And that is key that you see that because you can see the influence that Africa would have on that region. You would know that predominantly it was going to be dark skin originally. Okay, that region originally would have been inhabited by dark skinned melanated people, which or could they would be considered African. So I mean we're talking about Queen Sheba. It says that the spelling differentiation, however, may be uh, purely uh, fact factitious. The, the indigenous inscriptions make no difference, no such difference. And it says, and both uh, Yemenite and uh, look, African Sabians are there spelled in the exact same way. So, I mean, like they are making the, uh, the, 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 the claim that these Sabians and the Yemenite are African. Okay. And that Sabian tribes knew Sabian tribes knew the title of high official, Makeda or Makuta, the personal name given to the queen in Ethiopian legend. Might be interpreted as a popular rendering of the title. This title may be derived from ancient Egyptian. Protectors or housewife. So I mean, like you got ancient Egyptian. All these, all these, these uh, African countries have a direct impact on uh, Southern Arabia. So, so when we're talking about Arabs and what they looked like, they would have been considered dark-skinned, melanated people in their original form. Now we do know that due to like. Europeans coming into that region that there was a lightning up of that region to some degree at some point in time but the fact that they were darker in complexion when we talk about Moors and the Arabs being Moors they ba basically were referring to dark skinned people okay that the Christian Europeans were discovering and, and clumping them in together because they would see there were like dark skinned so-called, you know, Af what we would call, call today with African, so-called African features that had converted to Islam and were taking up the fight among Southern Europe. And so when these Christians would look at them and see how they were dressed and how they spoke Arabic or how they prayed, they would basically clump them all in as one. Okay. And they would clump the Arabs into being a Moor. And as you could tell, Moors or Arabs were considered pale, European or ca Caucasian, African people. Okay, so I mean, the term Moor, you know, derives from for African people that lived in North Africa. Uh, when we look at the, uh, like we said, the Berbers. When we look at the Berbers. Okay, they all, the Berbers actually inhabited pretty much the same 
area that later on the Arabs wind up taking over, okay? Berber language, bro, they said were ethnic group indigenous to North Africa, okay? So they say Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, all those places that were Madurib, okay? And to a lesser extent, Mauritania, Northern Mali, Northern Niger, okay? So these, these people, these Berbers, were the indigenous people of that northern region that we later said were European, or not European, but ca Caucasian Arabs wind up taking over at some point. But the original people in those same regions were Berbers. Okay? Like they said. They say Berber mean barbarian, okay? Romans use that to refer to German too. Okay, Celts, Iberians, Gauls, Gauls, Thracians, okay? They, they, they try to put that word Berber as a barbarian. Oh, these are barbarians. So Berber was a term that was put on them just being barbarian. Really didn't describe their ethnicity that way. Okay. So when we look at this, that this is the part I wanted to get into. It says for uh, Berber to refer to people of North Africa appeared only after the Muslim conquest. It says that Latin and Greek sources describe Moors, Africans, and barbarians, but never Berbers. The term the English term was introduced in the 19th century to replace an earlier barbary. So like when we talk about barbary and the barbary treaties, they're talking about Berbers. But these barbary treaties were with Moors. So all these terms become synonymous. Listen, the Berbers are the Mari. Okay, look at that. Was a Latin designation for Berber population of Mauritania. It was located in part of Africa, okay, west of Numidia. From the So by the sixth century, they to barbarian because who became dominant as Europeans in that century? By the time the 16th century come, the English are becoming the dominant European country to take dominance in the world. You know, like when you look at the 1400s, it was Spanish or the Portuguese. 
okay, the, the, the Portuguese and Spanish, Christopher Columbus, you know, sailed for them first. So, you know, by the time the 16th, 17th century come along, it's, it's really the English now that, that's gotten a dominance, particularly in what they call the so-called New World. Okay, but anyway, it says this, uh, the 16th to the 19th to refer to coastal regions of North Africa, uh, Maghrib, specifically the Ottoman borderlands consisting of regions seas of Tripoli. We talked about Tripoli. We talked about Algiers and Tunis. See, all these areas, the term is coined in reference to the Berbers, okay? So we're talking about, like, look, Bay, Day, all that. Now you're getting into it. Now you're getting into more modern times. By the time that the uh, English come on the scene in, you know, 16th, 1700s, 1800s, early 1800s. By the early 1800s, America had been founded, and they had went to Algiers or Tripoli and basically put them in check and said, you're not, you're not going to be doing that stuff that you was doing. You're not going to be out here raiding us, as, you know. To the to, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. So we're talking about all this is dealing with Moors and more science. Period. Period. They showing us. They putting it in your face, but you got to decipher. So um, I know we kind of got off into some tangents, but that's pretty much the video. I hope you guys enjoy the video. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to this video and this channel, and uh, hit the notification bell so you can get our newest, latest videos. So, 